expecting one thing, you're going to get another thing. Because on November 8th, I was expecting one thing, and I got another thing. And the world was expecting one thing, and they got another thing. And since then, we've been having to deal with the shit hand that we got. So today, we're going to learn how to fight fascism. So my name is Mike Montero. I'm a designer, and I'm also an immigrant in the fascist-occupied United States of America. And I have a question for you. Do you want to talk about design, or do you want to talk about politics? At this moment in time, with the world being what it is, with your civil liberties being threatened, with families being separated, with people being denied protection and services based on religion and gender and race. And once again, under the threat of nuclear war, and this is not a US problem, this is a world problem, and under the threat of fascism, do you want to talk about design? Applause? No? Or do you want to talk about politics? OK. Guess what? It's a trick question. Come on, you guys knew that. Design is always political. Every choice that we make is political. From who's from choosing who to work for, to the problems that we want to work on, to the decisions that we make while solving those problems, to the people involved in solving those problems, and the people not involved in solving those problems, and the way those solutions get implemented, and, most in, and to the people that those solutions are going to benefit or punish. Design is always political. Because design is labor. And your labor is political. And, po and the political is always designed. But Mike, I thought design was something else. I thought it was something that I could put on dribble or make a 100 days personal passion project about or a temporary tattoo. Let's define design. Design is the intentional solution to a problem within a set of constraints. There's three parts to this. First off, you need a problem to solve, like getting from point A to point B, or cutting down harassment on your social network. That's a problem in search of a design solution. Increasing shareholder value is not a problem. It's a desire possibly a fetish. Next, you need to know the constraints that you're working in. For example, it's got to be free, or it's got to be open to everyone, or maybe the water coming out of the kitchen faucet needs to be potable, things like that. Then, and only then, can you come up with a solution intended to solve that problem. That's the intentional part. Design is the intentional solution to a problem within a set of constraints. Let's take a look at some examples. And I'm going to have to talk a little bit about how, the, how, the, how US elections work, which is incredibly infuriating, and it's going to sound really stupid. And trust me, we all know that. This, this is North Carolina's 12th district. Now, for those that don't know, the way that we do things over there is we have 50 states, and then each of those states, we break them up into tiny little districts. And a congressional district gets to send one person to Congress, one person per district. And districts are based on populations. So every time we have a census, which is every 10 years, a state could gain or lose a district. And Districts tend to get redrawn based on what happens in those senses. 
and they get redrawn by the party in charge, which for a while has been Republicans. So the Republican Party, who was in charge at the time, after the 1990 census, when North Carolina gained enough of a population that they got a, another district, they came up with this incredibly obvious looking district. That's an obvious shape, right? You want to know what's special about it? It contains the cities of Winston-Salem, Greensboro, and Charlotte. Three cities with a majority African-American population. You get them all roped into one district. This is design. Let's go over our formula again. Who designed this? The Republican Party. What was the problem? Well, too many black people who tend to vote Democrat. And what was the intent? To lessen the representation of those people. Let me show you how. Let's say that a state has 50 people and 30 of them have a tendency to vote Democratic and 20 have a tendency to vote Republican. That is a Democratic majority, right? Right. And a national election in this state is going to go Democratic. But when it comes time to vote for congressional representation, we have to divide this state into districts. And by law, those districts need to be as equal as possible in population size. So let's say we divide it into five equal districts, each with 10 voters. So you get five districts, each with a Democratic majority, which mirrors the population of the state. But what if we did a little border math, a little, a little magic border math? What if we designed those districts just a little bit differently? And there's that word again, design. Still five districts, still equal in size. But if you take a look very carefully now, you will see that only two of those districts are sending a Democrat to Congress, and three of them are now sending a Republican. And it did this by grouping as many Democrats as possible into those two districts. So now it makes sense why you would create such a funny, weird-looking shape that encompassed Charlotte, Winston-Salem, and Greensboro, right? This is design. This is an intentional solution to a problem within a set of constraints. This is called gerrymandering. It is also called subverting the will of the people. And it's undemocratic. Here's some more examples of it. These are the shape of design. And these are designed this way for a reason. And you better believe that they're designed to screw someone. And not just someone. They're designed to keep the powerless from attaining power. They're designed to keep people from being represented. They're designed to keep people down. There's more. The Voting Rights Act, signed into law in 1965 to ensure that African Americans were not denied their right to vote, was designed to be a safeguard against racism. People who gave a shit designed the Voting Rights Act to make sure all Americans could participate in the electoral process, especially a group of Americans that had been systematically screwed. Now, in 2016, the Supreme Court repealed it. Supposedly, and I shit you not, because racism was over. They said that. Now, without the protection of the Voting Rights Act, many of the states with historically problematic race histories began designing laws to make voting harder supposedly in the name of, a, of solving a problem called voter fraud, but since we've had about four actual cases of voter fraud in the last 200 years, that kind of doesn't sound true to me. It's a lie. So what problem 
were they really solving? Oh, yeah. Our racist country went ahead and elected a black dude. That was the problem. What's the solution? You got to get less black people to vote. Was their solution intentional? Yes. Yes, it was. We know this because they broke a design rule. They broke the rule of constraints. One of the constraints in doing this is not getting caught. And they got caught, at least in North Carolina. And the judge said in this particular case, the, the judge who heard this confirms yet another design rule. There was intent. They intended to keep black people from voting. And just a few, uh, just about a month ago, a federal judge in Texas decided the same thing. It's okay though, it worked fine in other places. It worked fine in just enough places. In 2016, 14 states had new voting restrictions on the books. Restrictions made possible by the repeal of the Voting Rights Act. And they joined six states that had previously enacted voting restrictions. This was intentional. This was by design. This was the intentional solution to a problem within a set of constraints. These voting laws were all intended to make it harder for blacks to vote. We have a US judge in North Carolina on the record saying this. And you'll see that North Carolina is not one of those states. But no matter, North Carolina was just the cherry on the shit Sunday that was the 2016 presidential election. Because the 2016 presidential election gave us this. And anyone who wants to defend this behavior can leave right now. This is the result of that design decision. This is the result of intent. This is the result of that design decision. And this is the result of that design decision. And this is the result of that design decision. Years in the making, all with the goal of further disenfranchising the powerless, of holding on to power. The last gasp of a hateful generation. The last gasp of a small-minded minority. And yes, when there are three million less of you, you are by definition a minority because we won that election by three million votes. People intent on blaming immigrants, refugees, women, Muslims, trans folk for their own self-loathing. But you know what? This is also a result of that design decision. And this is a result of that design decision. And this is also a result of that design decision. And even this, which I got to see yesterday and saw the amazing notes on there and wished I could read them, but even without reading them, I understood this is a result of that design decision. And that's why we're here today. We're here today because we designed our way into this. And we can design our way out of it. We're here today because, strangely enough, I have never felt better <laughs> about the future. I have seen people of all ages, all colors, all races, all creeds come together to fight this shit. 
A month after the election, I was in Philadelphia, the city where I grew up, in a city where I used to get beat up on a daily basis for being an immigrant. And I was at a march at the airport where people were shouting in, in support of immigration. I've seen people protecting Muslims while they prayed at American airports. We're here today because this is our fight as much as anyone's. We're here today because we do not get to opt out. We need to design the future differently than we've designed the past. We need to look at the design decisions that got us to where we are today. We need to look at who made them. We need to look at who was left out of them. We need to look at who got screwed by them. And we need to look at who benefited from those decisions. Because design is intentional. So a system designed to fuck someone is designed to fuck someone on purpose. And when the same people keep getting fucked over and over and over again, it is definitely designed by, on purpose. And the time has come for designers to stop taking orders and understand your role in your community as a gatekeeper. So when we talk about design, and trust me, we are talking about design, we have to talk about the ethics of designers because a lack of ethics is a precursor to fascism. Our, only, our solutions can only be as good as we are. Our solutions can only be as good as the people making them. Our solutions can only be as good as our intent. And when the designers are rotten, the design is rotten. And when designers are contemptuous and filled with hate, the design will be contemptuous and filled with hate. A while back, the AIGA, which is an organization that says it takes care of designers in the US, tweeted this out. Should the poor behavior of big businesses concern the designers that work for them? Should it? How the fuck is this even a question? How is ethics and design even debatable? Can you imagine any other industry debating whether ethics was important? Can you imagine doctors debating whether ethics are important? Or accountants? or teachers, the people who take care of your kids, the people who take care of your parents. As a community, have we fallen to the level of debating the importance of ethics that's usually reserved for politicians, bankers, hedge fund managers, bookies and pimps? Apparently we have. This is Travis Kalanick the CEO of Uber and Silicon Valley Golden Boy. Last year, Travis Kalanick, his name rhymes with prick, <laughs> he joined Donald Trump's Business Advisory Council. And yeah, he stepped down. He stepped down because of protests and he stepped down because of bad PR. He doesn't get credit for stepping down. We get credit for knocking him off. And as he was agreeing to work with Trump, this is what he told his employees. We will partner with anyone as long as they're making transportation better. This is the 2017 equivalent of Mussolini promising to make the trains run on time. As long as it works in our benefit. We don't care how it happens. This is the exact opposite of ethics. And because I enjoy picking on Travis, because he's got a face only a boxing glove could love, let me throw in one more example. Susan Fowler, once an engineer at Uber, very courageously detailed out a history of harassment and abuse 
that she suffered at that company, not just from her managers, but also by their own HR department, their own human resources department, a department theoretically put in place to protect employees. But as workers continue to give up their rights, places like Uber's become more and more like company towns of old, with HR departments behaving like thugs hired by the company to root out troublemakers. This is also by design. We spent a generation rolling back the rights of workers, rights that were hard won, rights that people died for. And we've traded those rights for the oblique promise of options and swordfish at lunch in the cafeteria. And you don't get to make fun of poor people buying lottery tickets when you've traded in all of your rights as a worker for a chance to start it rich when your startup goes public. It is the same thing. So whether you call yourself a designer, an engineer, an entrepreneur, or God help us all, a CEO, working ethically is a non-negotiable part of your job, is the most important part of your job. And working ethically means working in the best interests of everyone. It means fulfilling your duty to make the world a better place. It means helping those that need the most help, as Eric so eloquently spoke about earlier. It means hiring people who look like the people whose problems you're trying to solve. And it means no one gets left behind and no one gets treated like a, a second-class citizen. This is who we need to be. And we must work with intent. I want all of us to take stock of who we are and what we're capable of. We are people who make things for a living. We bring things into existence. And even if you've been hired pe by people to bring their things into existence, we still have a responsibility to ask ourselves, are these good things? Are these good things that I'm making? Are these good things that I'm spending my time on? Is, or is the purpose of this thing that I'm spending my time on, the precious little time that I have on Earth, is its purpose to keep someone down? Is what I am doing today making the world a better place? This came out a couple of weeks ago. A design firm wants to make Trump's wall a big, beautiful, and sustainable. Fuck them. Design is always political, from who is making it to who it impacts. And telling yourselves otherwise is the biggest lie that we can tell ourselves. You cannot design a good border wall. It is a border wall. It is meant to separate people from each other. You cannot design a good Muslim database. You cannot design a good gun, because all of these things are inherently evil. And he talks about some bullshit about pure form. Fuck pure form. We need to stop measuring form and start measuring impact. The impact of what we do on our world needs to be the thing that we care about the most as designers. Now, early last year, in the wake of one of the many, 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 many gun shootings in America, the government, the one in San Bernardino, the government demanded that Apple hack into a shooter's iPhone because it was encrypted. And Apple refused. You remember this? And in their refusal, Tim Cook, Apple's CEO, said that writing that software and putting it in the government's hands would be too dangerous. He said, I will not make this because then it will exist and I will have brought it into the world. And when it gets misused, which it will, the blood will be on their hands as well. And not all of us are lucky enough to work with somebody who would take that kind of ethical stance. And God knows they don't take that kind of ethical stance on everything they do, but they nailed this one. Some of us work for people like Travis Kalanick. In fact, I'd say that most of us work for people like Travis Kalanick. And it is our job as gatekeepers, 
as designers and as human beings to stop the Travis Kalanicks of the world. But Mike, won't somebody else do it? I get this question a lot, and the answer is yes, they might. And holy shit, that can make you feel powerless. It really can. But here's the thing. Just because the person next to you might be an asshole, that's not a good enough excuse for you to be an asshole. And I get that you don't want to lose your job. I get that you have rent to pay. But earning that at the expense of somebody else's livelihood and somebody else's freedom is not a good way to live. So rather than ask yourself, won't somebody else make it, ask yourself, what if me saying no is the inspiration to other people to stand up? What if me saying no is the first step in a movement? What if me saying no is the first step in making things right? Do I want to get you fired from your jobs? No, I don't. Do I think some of you might? Yes, I do. I don't want to lie to you. I never said it would be easy, but I promise you it'll be worth it. Because in the end, if we stand up for ourselves, if we behave with agency, if we do the job right, we will become more effective at what we do. We will become more powerful in what we do. We will sleep better at night, and we will be doing the right thing. We will be designing the world to be a better place. How do we do this? Well, I have some ideas. You can't follow orders anymore. If you want to fight fascism, you cannot just blindly follow the orders that you are giving. What you need is you need to question every single decision that you're making and ask yourself, where could this decision lead? Because our goal here isn't just to thwart fascism in the here and now, and it is here. Our goal is to help build a better world where fascism has a much harder job taking root. That means that we need to analyze the things that we are asked to do. We need to look at it from several points of view. And we need different points of view in the room when these things are being designed. When your design team is 90% white and male, you've already started marginalizing people. And the minute that you start marginalizing people, you have created the perfect petri dish for fascism to grow. Here's an article I came across recently. Palantir provides the engine for Donald Trump's deportation machine. Palantir, for those of you unfamiliar with the devil, is the data mining company founded by Peter Thiel. This is the guy who took down Gawker, by the way. And regardless of how you might have felt about Gawker, the idea that an individual can shut down the press by brute force bankrolling lawsuits that he had absolutely nothing to do with should scare the shit out of you. Peter Thiel is also a Trump crony. So his company, Palantir, is designing the data mining operation that the Immigration and Customs Enforcement is using to identify and round up immigrants in the United States. Now here's a process diagram for that. And I know it does that because that's what it says. Now, here's the thing. This diagram was made by a designer of some sort. Maybe they call themselves an engineer, it doesn't matter. What matters is that they knew what this was going to be used for, and they designed it. And other designers are going to come in, they're going to do the interface. Other designers are going to come in, and they're going to do the development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They are following orders. Except the orders are unethical. They are intended to cause harm to others. And as a designer, this has to matter to you. Which brings us back to Tim Cook and his decryption software. Something we consider too dangerous to create. We create these things. Our labor is in them. And when your labor is in something, you bear responsibility for what you create. You can't just wash your hands of it. If you're designing a gun, you can't be surprised when that gun kills someone. 
If you design decryption software, you can't be surprised when that decryption software is used to hack into people's private information. And when you design data mining software targeted at Muslims or immigrants, you can't be surprised when that software is used to round up Muslims and immigrants. This job that we do carries with it a set of ethics that is just as important, if not more so, than any other skill that we have. And the question of should I design it is infinitely more important than can I design it. And it is your duty as a designer to bring up things that do not pass that ethical test. And having brought them up, if you find yourself in a position where your concerns are being dismissed, or you find out that hurting people is actually the objective of the thing you're building, you need to stop. You need to bring that work to a grinding halt by any means necessary. And it is also my duty that if I find out you do not care about ethics and design, I do everything in my power to talk you out of being a designer. 1971, Victor Popanek published Design for the Real World, the best design book you will ever read, bar none. This is the first sentence in the book. There are professions more harmful than industrial design, but only a very few of them. This predates the internet as we know it. So I can only imagine what Victor would have had to say about the dangers of the digital age. This shit that we do is so enmeshed in people's lives now. We have devices watching us, tracking us, measuring us, telling us when to take our meds, helping us get off. And I'm not so much telling you that these things are awful. They're not. I'm just pointing out how very, 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 very careful we have to be in how we design them. Let's pick on Travis some more, okay? Fucker can't stop being in the news. <laughs> March 3rd, 2017, Mike Isaac of the New York Times publishes an expose on a, of an internal tool used at Uber called Grayball. Now, Grayball is something that they're using in cities where they're not allowed to be operating or where there was flat out, op, you know. Grayball is a database that keeps tracks of accounts that Uber thinks may be associated with city officials or law enforcement or investigators. And if any of those people try to hail a car, they get a fake map. They get a map that shows no rides available. Is this unethical? Fuck yes, it's unethical. It was unethical to conceive. It was unethical to design. It was unethical to implement. It was unethical to maintain. And every Uber employee that touched Grayball behaved unethically. They designed it with the purpose of deceiving a segment of the population. And never forget that the one thing companies like Uber need to exist is income disparity. The entire service economy is built on that premise. We need one group of people with enough income to pay a second group of people desperate for income to perform menial tasks. The rise of fascism in America came at the time of the highest income disparity America has ever seen. That's not an accident. That's by design. And this is where the majority of designers are putting their time and talent. More than ever, we need to look at how we're designing the world and who is designing it. We need to take stock in who we're working for, and we need to take stock in what they're doing. We have serious problems to solve. Make sure that you're working at places that actually care about solving them. And work on ways that actually empower people. And for Christ's sake, hire some goddamn women in Silicon Valley already. <laughs> you don't get to complain about the lack of women on Trump's team when you've got an even higher lack of women in Silicon Valley. As designers, we need to fulfill our mission of being gatekeepers. Our job is to improve the world for everyone, not just those in power. 
We do not work for fascists. There is no reason to reach out to fascists. We do not build bridges to fascists. We do not need to understand fascism. When your worldview is based around giving other people their civil rights, you forfeit yours. Now we're in this situation because we designed the world to work this way. The rescinding of the Voting Rights Act, the gerrymandering of congressional districts, the existence of the Electoral College, the underfunding of schools to create an undereducated electorate. We did all that and we have to undo it. And it's gonna take a fuck ton of time, which honestly, I'm not sure that we have. But as Henry Rollins said, this is the fight Joe Strummer trained, you, trained us for. Now sadly, he's no longer with us, but you know what? We got people like Dana Chisnell working on how to improve our election process at the Center for Civic Design. We got people like Nick O'Neill and Rebecca Kaufman who built fivecalls.org, a site that makes it super easy to call your Congress people. We got Robin Canner who built my trans health to make sure that the trans community has the dignity that it deserves. And we got anonymous people slipping thank you notes into books for kids who are curious and open-minded enough to know about Islam. And more importantly, all over America, people are speaking out. They're organizing. They're calling their Congress people. They're showing up in town halls. We will be asked to create things that lead to income disparity. We will be asked to build their walls. We will be asked to build their databases. And some of us will lose our jobs when we say no. But I would rather live poor and free than rich and compromised. So we fight. We fight because we can't not fight. We fight because maybe this is the cliche, darkest before the dawn. We fight because if we don't, people get beat up. They get rounded up. They get stripped of their dignity and they get killed. And while this may or may not happen in a large government sanctioned way, it is definitely going to happen in small pockets of deplorable misery throughout the world. And there are things we can do to prevent it. We have to try. And never forget the words of the great Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Have some water. Wow. I, I, I'm not sure I can ask you any questions after this. Well, uh, we're out of time, too. <laughs> yeah, we are. I, I take it by your applause that you'll uh, be opening up Sweden's borders again tomorrow. Yeah. Like this this gives, gives me shivers. Um, Mike, we're so happy to have you here the second Thank time you. around. Um, I'm really happy that you changed the subject of your talk, uh, like yesterday. <laughs> Thank you. And I guess all of us are. And um, so when all of us get back to work tomorrow, how should our colleagues that aren't here notice a change? Well, take what you heard here today. I mean, you know all this stuff already. You do. You know it. It's deep down inside. You were raised by good people who taught you well. And then you went to school and they took it out of you. And in your whole life, people have been trying to get you to forget that, that good seed deep down inside you. Let it grow, man. Be the people that your dogs think you are.
Okay, Mike, so by now we all know that you're outspoken politically, and everyone following you on Twitter and Instagram is someone. We know that you also uh, love uh, vinyls and hip-hop and punk, right? Uh -huh. And I know my colleague Jessica already sent you her favorite Spotify links. It's been a long time since a girl made me a mixtape. Yeah. It's pretty nice. <laughs> so, so I would also like to leave you with something like the best of Sweden. Um, so here is an offline version for you. And it's, oh, it's hip-hop, it's political, it's feminist, it's Swedish. It's one of my favorites. And yeah, it's a game changer. Sivana <laughs> Imam. I have... No idea what this is, and I'm so excited to hear it. Thank you so She's much. She's great. Thank you. Thank you. So great having you here. Oh, and a book. Thank you. A big hand again for Mike.